Hi, I'm Gopal Rao and I'm editor of MRS Bulletin. And today it's my pleasure to talk with Professor Susan Trollier McKinstry of the Pennsylvania State University. Professor Trollier McKinstry is the Stuart S. Flashen Professor of Material Science and Engineering and also Electrical Engineering mm -hmm. at Penn State. Uh, she was the 2017 president of the Materials Research Society and is finishing her term on the MRS Board of Directors this year. Her research interests span thin film dielectric and piezoelectric materials and applications, including fundamental mechanisms and device uh, integration. So our focus today is some uh, work by you and your group, Susan, on using piezoelectric thin films for the future LYNX, um, next generation X-ray telescope, uh, which will be a successor to the very successful Chandra X-ray mm -hmm. telescope. So let's start with the big question. Mm -hmm. How might materials research help us understand the origins of the universe and the nature of black holes? That's a beautiful question. Uh, the X-ray astronomy community is trying to build a telescope that will allow us to have far better angular resolution uh, with better collecting power, optical collecting power, than any existing telescope. And the major challenge that this imposes uh, really leads to why material science is essential to this. So um, if you look at the Chandra telescope, uh, the important thing to recognize is that x-rays are focused on reflection from curved surfaces. So there's actually two sets of mirrors with different curvatures that are used to focus those x-rays. And the exact shape of that curvature is essential to your ability to focus. In the Chandra telescope, when they were trying to create very perfect surfaces, they had huge pieces of glass. They're, they're almost two centimeters in thickness. They're that thick to keep them rigid enough so that the perfection of the shape can be maintained when you literally pick the cylinder up, launch it into space, uh, do the release from gravity. The weight of those four mirror segments was about 800 kilograms large enough that they literally could not afford a higher launch weight. And so now as we look to creating a next generation telescope that will allow us larger correcting power, we have to move from these massive, heavy pieces of glass towards something that is vastly thinner, um, probably on the order of a few tenths of a millimeter thick but we need to retain those large sizes. And the huge question is how do we retain shape in very precisely figured surfaces? And so if we can do that, if all these things happen, then we can study fainter objects than we've ever been able to study. Uh, and this is all being proposed by the astronomy community as a way of understanding the physics of how our universe was was created, uh, understanding how black holes evolve. Uh, and so why does materials matter here? Well, somebody's got to make these mirror segments and has to be able to make them with the precision and uh, potentially the ability to reconfigure those surfaces so that we actually can study these faint objects. And so that's partly what um, a very large group of people uh, in the astronomy community are aimed at and they're relying on material scientists and engineers to make some of, the, some of these desires possible. <laughs> oh, that's really fascinating. So, so obviously materials seem to be critical for the LYNX telescope. Yeah. So natural follow-up question, how do you choose the materials for this application? Uh, that's another really good question. So there are currently uh, three main technologies that are being investigated for these mirrors. Uh, the first is to use very thin glass. So imagine a 300, maybe 500 micron thick sheet of glass that's a meter or more in diameter with a very precise surface. So how do I choose something? Well, it has to have an appropriate stiffness. It has to be mechanically figurable so I get the exact shape that I want. If we can't imagine doing this in these huge surfaces, well, now we need to imagine, can I make smaller segments where I might use the, the physical dimension to increase the rigidity somewhat? 
And then what are the right materials there? So silicon is being explored as well as glass is being explored. Um, for all of these technologies, there's an open question as to whether it will be possible to make surfaces with figures with the absolute precision that's required to get to half an arc second final telescope resolution. And if you can't make it and retain that after launch, after gravity release, after all of the epoxies that are used to hold the segments together have shrunk, as epoxies tend to do, uh, then perhaps we'll need to be able to develop a means to reconfigure surfaces by making the optics adjustable. And that's where my own particular expertise comes in. Uh, and so in that case, what we needed was a substrate that could be slumped to close to the correct shape where I could heat treat that material at temperatures that were high enough that I could put down a high strain piezoelectric material that would allow us to locally distort surfaces with applied electric fields and it had to survive those process temperatures. And so this means now I have to look at glasses with high slumping temperatures, uh, preferably without alkali in them so that we never have drift of um, mobile ions during the oper and long-term operation of these telescopes. How do I put down electrodes and then functional piezoelectric materials that allow us to do this, this reconfiguration? Once we do that, let's imagine that this actually goes to scale. Uh, they're currently scoping the telescope and the estimates is that there will be somewhere between 200 and 10,000 square meters of adjustable optics. I think that's a hoot. I work on piezoelectric microelectromechanical systems. That is the largest microelectromechanical system I will probably ever work on. And now we need to put adjusters, say, every five millimeters square, which means we now take this interesting material science and we add on a very interesting control problem the solution of which is to apply material science again. So taking the same generic technologies that we use in all of our displays for cell phones and computers to do row column addressing is the way that we're addressing how do we, how do we actually speak to an individual cell and say, I need this much voltage on this cell. And now it becomes a material science problem because how do I take the materials, the semiconductor materials that are used for row column addressing and build it on sh curved glass with a high strain piezoelectric in place. And so a lot of the, the work that's been done over the years to develop new materials that can be processed at low temperatures with atomic layer deposition is essential to the ultimate success. Um, hopeful success of this proposed telescope. Okay. Yeah. Very interesting. So are there any fundamental barriers to the materials integration that's needed? There are substantial barriers. Um, glasses that I can readily slump into shape to get the close to the correct shape also tend to distort uh, when I uh, run through thermal processing steps. And so among the key issues that we've had to address over the years is how do I encourage nucleation of a material like a lead zirconate titanate perovskite at the lowest possible temperatures that the material can tolerate? How do we control or at least ad adapt to residual stresses for all of the layers that are deposited? How do we understand and predict uh, changes in that behavior over the lifetime of the telescope? The hope is that this will launch and then collect data for decades. And so now we also have interesting material science challenges. I have to have materials that will, will survive under electric field for decades. Mm -hmm. uh, and so maybe I need to understand how those materials are changing, how all of the constituent materials that go into the engineering, literally how do I hold a thin sheet of glass without bending it? If I bend it, how do I correct for it? How do I adjust for the fact that epoxies do tend to distort very thin optical segments over time? So yeah. clearly there's a lot of research ahead. There's a lot that needs to be done 
um, no matter which of the technologies they go with, it's yeah. it's a it's actually quite a lot of fun to watch yeah. the evolution of the program. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's very very good for materials research as a whole. Um, can the same principle of adaptive optics mm -hmm. using piezoelectric materials be used for more conventional terrestrial optical applications Absolutely. or other space applications as well? Of course. So the Hubble Space Telescope, the correctors that were put on uh, that restored the Hubble to its original performance are kissing cousins to piezoelectrics. They in fact used electrostrictors mm -hmm. in that application and that was used to if the primary mirror was misground. They put a secondary mirror in the optical path that had the opposite error in the correction. But now you need to be, be able to very precisely position the secondary mirror with respect to the primary or you further degrade the optics. And so yes, that's an application where we've seen this done enormously successfully to huge science benefit um, over the last several decades. Generically adjustable optics are agnostic as to the wavelength. So this can be done for x-rays, for visible light, for infrared uh, optics. So the technology uh, we anticipate will be, will be much more broadly applied. Uh, we are very interested in being able to use this for ground-based telescopes as well. Uh, our atmosphere causes twinkle, so there, there are very subtle variations in the refractive index of our atmosphere that lead to optical distortions that can be corrected. Uh, there are uh, certainly a number of telescopes that operate on this principle, mm -hmm. many of which use thousand volt actuators behind it to do the precise configuration of the surfaces. Uh, my own research is to try and move away from that 100 or 1,000 volt application to something where we can do all of the corrections at less than 10 volts, uh, which vastly simplifies the, the weight of the power systems that go up to, to drive the actuators and makes the control electronics far easier. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Um, so I'd like to finish up by asking you about some of the other work in your group. I know you have a large research group mm -hmm. at Penn State. Mm -hmm. uh, would you like to briefly mention some of those other areas? Sure. Uh, if you look at my the research portfolio that, that the group operates in, there's really three key areas that it breaks down to. Uh, the first is to try and understand what controls, what mechanisms control the fundamentals of why uh, electrically active materials have the properties they have. What controls the dielectric constant as a function of temperature or frequency or magnitude of the AC electric field. Likewise for the piezoelectric response of all the mechanisms that in principle could contribute which actually do. And so part of my group studies those fundamental mechanisms often using uh, model experiments so that we can unpick one particular factor. Uh, we often have to develop uh, new characterization techniques to make measurements that aren't in bog standard measurements. So we often are in the process of, of trying to to expand field ranges, to expand frequency ranges, to expand spatial ranges at which we can do absolutely quantitative measurements of materials response. That portion of my group also, we, we use that to try and understand of all the mechanisms that can contribute. If I have a particular application, I often want not just one material property to be optimized. I often need a combination of properties. And so we look at the various figures of merit for particular applications. And we try and understand how would I optimize sets of materials properties simultaneously. And so we, we do, again, model experiments. How do I decide how I'm depositing a material so that I can choose the functional properties that will result. So that's sort of the first third of my group. The second third of my group does what I'll call processing science. So we've invented a cool new material. How do I put it on an eight inch wafer? How do I put it on glass surfaces that aren't flat? How do I do this at arbitrary temperatures? 
And then because I work on electroceramics, which almost always have at least three cations in the system with wildly different vapor pressures, uh, very different etching rates, how do I take these interesting materials and pattern them without damaging them? And so that's kind of the second third of my research group. And then the last chunk of my research group does a lot of work on microelectromechanical systems. And so we make widgets that move and shake. Um, and that ranges from um, miniaturized medical ultrasound systems uh, that are small enough that you can put a in a pill and swallow, or perhaps um, be able to use to investigate uh, surface and subsurface features near the skin uh, for skin cancers or for cancers of the eye. Uh, we also do a lot of work on uh, being able to scavenge energy from ambient mechanical sources. Um, this is of interest to power devices, for example, for the Internet of Things, mm -hmm. where we're going to emplace enormous num numbers of sensors, which means we either need to provide power to all of those sensors with cords or figure out how to do local power. Um, placement. <laughs> and so we're looking at can where and when can we appropriately uh, use mechanical energy, energy as a means of providing local power sources. Uh, we've also done work on potential replacements for uh, silicon CMOS transistors. And so we've looked at uh, vastly miniaturized devices that utilize transduction through strain as the driving force that allows us to do computation. And so those are the kinds of areas that we work on. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Susan, for talking with us today.